Welcome to Norse Mythology, the unofficial guide. It's unofficial because I'm neither a credentialed academic nor a time-traveling medieval Norse pagan, but I deal with this material directly from the sources, interpreted through the lens of the experts and their opinions. If you're looking for depth and detail in a simple and accessible way, then you're in the right place. Vaxat tu nu, Vimur. Als mik thik vava ti der, jot nagar da i, vets tu f thu vex, ot tho vex mer osmegen, javn hat up sem himen. Typically, we think of Thor as possessing three powerful tools. According to Snorri Sturluson in his prose Edda, Thor has his hammer, Mjolnir, as well as a girdle of might called Megingjord that doubles his already godly strength whenever he wears it, and a pair of iron gloves, called Jorngreper, that we are told Thor must not be missing when he is against the hammer's shaft. However, curiously, neither the girdle nor the gloves ever show up in the Poetic Edda. This doesn't mean Snorri invented them, though. The girdle in particular is featured in a 10th century poem called Thorstropa, which Snorri quotes as a source when retelling the story of Thor's visit to the home of a Jotun named Gerroder. Snorri also inserts the girdle into another one of his prose retellings, but the iron gloves in particular don't show up anywhere outside of Snorri's version of the Gerroder story, which we'll be talking about today. So the idea that Thor actually needs these gloves in order to use the hammer is a dubious one to say the least. But even stranger than this is the fact that Thor actually makes use of another powerful tool in this story— that Snorri seems to have forgotten about entirely when explaining Thor's inventory. So let's dig in and see where this idea of a girdle of might and iron gloves actually comes from. Snorri recounts this story in the section of the prose edda called Skoldskaparmol, which is structured as a conversation between two characters named Agir and Bragi. In the mythology, Agir is a Jotun whose hall is often used when the gods want to have a feast, and Bragi is one of the gods, specifically the husband of Idun, whose apples keep the Asir from becoming old. However, Snorri presents these characters euhemeristically as people living in Scandinavia. In Skaldskaparmol, Agir visits the Asir in Osgarder, which Snorri often presents in this context as a city in Sweden. And when he is welcomed in for drinks, he strikes up a conversation with Bragi, in which case Bragi teaches him the ins and outs of skaldic poetry. Doing this requires him to recount some of the myths that poetic references are based on, and one of those myths is the story of what took place the time Thor visited the home of Geirroder. On that particular occasion, Snorri explains through Bragi's voice, Thor did not actually have his hammer, nor his girdle, nor his iron gloves with him, all on account of Loki's actions. You see, Loki had once gone flying, using the goddess Frigg's falcon skin, and out of curiosity, he flew into the courtyard of a Jotun named Gerroder, where he saw a great hall and decided to lower himself down and peer through the window. But when he did, Gerroder saw him and ordered that the bird should be caught and brought to him. If you'll recall, Loki has borrowed Freya's falcon skin on a couple of occasions that we've talked about already and used it to transform himself into a bird. In this case, we see him once again shapeshifting into the form of a falcon while wearing the skin, but we are left to wonder why it is Frigg's falcon skin and not Freya's he is wearing this time. We are also left to wonder why both goddesses should have a magical animal skin that allows the wearer to turn into a bird. The poem Volundarkvida seems to indicate that the bird skins allowing a person to fly are a characteristic feature of Valkyries, women who choose which warriors should die on the battlefield and be taken to Odin's hall upon death. And there's a lot about Freya that appears very Valkyrie-esque, such as the poem Grimnismal stating that she chooses half the warriors who die in battle each day, and Snorri's mention of her doing this when she rides into battle. But we don't have much of the same type of information regarding the goddess Frigg. In episode 11, we talked about the possible origins of Odin as part of ancient belief in the Wild Hunt. Anatoly Lieberman suggested that the evolution of the demonic leader of the Wild Hunt into the chief of the Asir gods resulted in two divine figures with similar names, both Odin, who is the husband of Frigg, and Othar, who just so happens to be the husband of Freya. Interestingly, while the goddess Frigg shows up in the scant references to Germanic paganism that survived outside of Scandinavia, Freya does not— 
And as it so happens, the words Freyr and Freya are actually just titles, meaning lord and lady. There is some solid evidence coming from places like Inglinga Saga, Gesta Danorum, and Eastlendinga Book that Freyr's actual name is Ingvi, and that he was at some point referred to as Ingvi Freyr, meaning Lord Ingvi, before coming to be known in the Norse tradition as simply Freyr. But in that case, what is Freya's name? Some scholars have hypothesized that at some point before the Eddas were composed, there may have been a single character called Frigg Freya, meaning Lady Frigg, who later split into two separate characters in the North by the time poems like Locusena were composed, which is a story placing both Frigg and Freya in the same room at the same time. They are certainly separate characters in the Norse corpus we have today, but this possible split could serve to explain why we see Loki borrowing Freya's falcon shape most of the time, but in this story, the falcon shape is suddenly Frigg's. As Loki sat perched way up high on Gerother's window, laughing to himself about future generations' confusion over whose falcon shape he was wearing, an unnamed servant began scaling the wall to catch him. The servant was having a lot of trouble doing this, which was amusing to Loki, and so he decided to wait until the man had climbed all the way up the wall to finally fly away and make his escape at the very last second. But when the moment came and Loki tried to take flight, he found that his feet were stuck, and the servant captured him. When he was brought to Gerother, Gerother looked into the falcon's eyes, and something about them gave the impression that there must be a person somewhere in there. So he tried to ask questions, but... Loki remained silent, until Gerother got frustrated, locked him in a chest, and starved him there for three months. Finally, Loki admitted who he was, and made a deal with Gerother, who promised to let him go, if Loki, in return, would promise to trick Thor into coming to Gerother's home without his hammer or his girdle of might. It's worth noting that in Snorri's source, Thorsdrapa, this entire introduction is non-existent, the poem begins by calling Loki an amazing liar who convinces Thor that he would find, quote, green paths in the direction of Gerother's courts, and that Thor was eager to kill some Jotnar. I usually interpret this as meaning Loki might have made it sound like Gerother would be an easy kill. Snorri doesn't explain exactly how Loki convinces Thor to make this journey without his characteristic tools, but for whatever reason, he does. While on the way, Thor stays the night with a Jotun woman named Grither, which seems related to the word greed. This is the same woman with whom Odin has a son named Vidar, who will ultimately avenge Odin's death at Ragnarok. Now, Grither also happens to be the mother of all plot vouchers, because she just so happens to have her very own girdle of might, a pair of iron gloves, and a staff called Gridervolr, which means like Grither's wand, that she lends to Thor to help him on his journey. So the next day, Thor sets out to wade across the greatest of all rivers, a river called Vimur, all decked out with these three special items he's borrowed from Grither. The current in the river is strong, so Thor buckles on his girdle of might and presses down with his staff on the side away from the current, while Loki, who is apparently along for the ride, holds onto Thor beneath the girdle. In Thorstrapa, we also have mentions of Thor's servant-slash-sidekick Thjalvi being present on the journey, and Loki kind of disappearing from the narrative. But either way, when Thor gets to the middle of the river, suddenly the water level rises such that it now covers his shoulders, and in response, Thor speaks a verse to the river, wherein he tells it not to rise, because even if it does, his strength is just going to rise to match. In fact, it's the verse I recited at the beginning of this episode— and it's one of my favorite Norse verses to think about with regard to having the fortitude to overcome impossible things. Quote, Rise not thou now, Vimer, since I desire to wade thee into the giant's courts. Know thou that if thou risest, then will rise the os strength in me up as high as heaven. End quote. Then Thor notices the reason for the river's sudden rise. Up the river a little way, in a cleft, he sees one of Gerother's daughters, Gjolp, standing astride the river, and quote, she was causing it to rise, end quote. The imagery of her standing astride the river is intended to help us understand exactly how she is causing it to rise, which is by urinating into it. Thor picks up a big stone out of the river at this point, and he says, quote, at its outlet must a river be stemmed, and he throws the stone at Gjelp. 
Snorri delicately explains that, quote, he did not miss what he was aiming at, end quote, and was then able to make it close enough to the riverbank to grasp a rowan bush and pull himself out of the river. Hence comes the saying, Snorri tells us, that Thor's salvation is a rowan. At some point shortly thereafter, Thor arrives at Gerother's, and he and his companion are shown to their lodging, which turns out to be a goat shed, and the only piece of furniture in there is a single chair. So Thor sits on it. But suddenly he finds himself being lifted into the air towards the roof. He quickly pushes back against the rafters with Greether's staff until he hears a loud crack and a great scream. Back on the ground now, Thor discovers that Gerother's daughter Gjölp has returned alongside her sister Grape, and both of them have just tried to lift the chair for some reason. Maybe they were trying to smash Thor against the ceiling or something, but whatever they were trying to do, they will never try to do it again because Thor has just broken both of their backs. Gerother, apparently unaware of what has just happened, now has Thor called into his hall for games. And when Thor enters, he finds that there are great fires all along the length of the hall. As he comes through the doorway, Gerother immediately picks up a pair of tongs, pulls a glowing hot lump of iron out from the fire, and throws it at Thor. But Thor is wearing his iron gloves. With their protection, he's able to catch the lump of iron, and he raises it up into the air in preparation of throwing it back. Gerother realizes he's in trouble at this point, so he runs behind an iron pillar for protection. But Thor throws the hot lump of iron straight at the pillar, whereupon it easily crashes right through, blasts through Gerother's body, blows a hole through the wall behind him, and smashes into the ground outside. The end. Or is it? In Thor's Droppa, the ending is told a little differently. After throwing the lump of iron at Gerother, Thor suddenly takes up his hammer, which he explicitly does not have in Snorri's version, and proceeds to destroy all of Gerother's, quote, bench fellows, indicating that the hall was probably not actually empty apart from the two of them. Thor's Droppa also never explicitly mentions the iron gloves. So in the one story where Thor uses these gloves, we are told the hammer isn't even present. But in another version of the same story, where the hammer is present, the gloves are never mentioned. The hammer and gloves are literally never described together, apart from Snorri's one inexplicable statement that Thor must wear them when using the hammer. In light of that, it's possible Snorri invented this detail, or maybe was influenced by a post-Christianization folk belief about Thor that wasn't actually backed up by any pagan era material. In any case, it's a mystery why Snorri bothered to ascribe so much importance to Thor's belt and gloves, but completely forgot about the staff. At the risk of inserting too much of my own personal theories into the show, I am of the opinion that the narrative underlying the two versions of the Gerother story we have might be especially old. The reason I say this is because it looks to me like it preserves not only an association of the falcon skin with Frigg instead of Freya, but also the memory of a thunder god bearing multiple weapons. So, to find that memory, let's jump backward in time to the 3rd century AD, which is around 500 years before the Norse period begins. At this point in the history of Europe, Rome is having trouble. The empire is splitting into multiple independent states, so-called barbarian invasions are rampant, and the government is largely unstable. During this time, Romans living north of the Mediterranean develop a particular practice of burying and cremating women and children with small pendants, often made of gold, that were made to look like wooden clubs, complete with little spots that look like branches have been broken off from the main body of the club. It's the type of thing you might imagine in the hand of Hercules, and in fact one particular find even has an inscription on it that reads D-E-O-H-E-R. Werner, in 1964, reconstructed this as Deo Hercules and claimed that this solidifies in writing an association between these pendants and the weapon of the famous classical demigod. Around the 4th century, as the club pendant trend began to die off among the Romans, it seems to have been picked up by Germanic-speaking people across the Roman border, although the artistry changed a bit in that context. The pendants still appear to be clubs, and they were still found exclusively within the graves of women and children. But the branch scars were replaced with concentric circles and various line designs, 
and the shapes of the pendants themselves became more deliberately geometric, usually in the shape of a cone or an elongated prism. This trend continued among continental Germanic groups until around the year 700 AD, roughly a century before the Viking Age began. They've been found across wide-ranging territory from Britain to Serbia and everywhere in between, although none have been found north of Schleswig-Holstein, meaning they are a decidedly non-Scandinavian trend. Zemeck notes that the archaeological record shows evidence of an association between the Germanic thunder god on the continent, who we'll call Thunraz based on time and place, and the Roman Hercules at this time. In areas where there was a heavy amount of Roman influence, we even have evidence of cult figures called Hercules Magisinus and Hercules Saxonus that appear to have been actual mergers of Thunraz and Hercules. Even in modern times, it's easy to see the similarities between Hercules bashing enemies with his club and Thor bashing enemies with his hammer. Both ideas may be independent memories of an older Indo-European tradition of some kind of divine bludgeoning. Werner chose to call the Germanic club pendants Donar amulets in honor of the old High German version of Thor's name, and he concluded that they were forerunners to the Mjolnir pendants that have been found by archaeologists and dated largely to the Viking Age. This alone is sufficient for us to wonder whether the continental version of Thor might have been seen by some as a club-wielding god during the migration period. Given that we see Thor wield not his hammer, but a plausibly wooden staff in the Gerother story, combined with Adam of Bremen's 11th century account of a statue of Thor in a temple at Uppsala, Sweden, holding not a hammer, but something Adam called a scepter, is perhaps cause for us to wonder whether this idea might have bled into Scandinavian tradition in one way or another. It's entirely possible that these ideas are not related at all, but the absence of a hammer and the presence of a wooden weapon is certainly interesting in light of these Donar amulets. The Gerother story also takes the motif of Thor solving problems by throwing things at them and places not a hammer into his hand, but a stone, or a stone-like object, twice. Thor is well known for throwing his hammer at his enemies. For instance, he throws it at the World Serpent while on a fishing trip with the Jotun Himir, and he throws it at Hrungnir during their epic duel. But here, when Gjölp makes the river rise, he throws a stone at her, and later he kills her father by means of throwing a glowing metal ingot. When Saxo makes mention of this story in Gesta Danorum, he adds another fun layer to his descriptions of Thor's attacks. Quote, Thorkill, who was well aware of the reasons behind things, taught them that once the god Thor, harassed by the giant's insolence, had driven a burning ingot through the vitals of Geroth, who was struggling against him. And when this fell farther, it had bored through and smashed the sides of the mountain. He confirmed that the women had been struck by the force of Thor's thunderbolts and had paid the penalty for attacking his divinity by having their bodies broken, end quote. Here, although he might potentially be influenced by the classical tradition, Saxo actually gives us a direct connection between Thor's attacks and thunderbolts. Since Thor's name literally means thunder, and because we see him throwing objects at his enemies pretty frequently, it is hard not to be reminded about the extremely widespread folk belief in the idea of thunderstones. If you aren't already aware, thunderstones are the name given to small Stone Age tools that have been misunderstood as having fallen from the sky during a thunderstorm or with a bolt of lightning. Thunderstone folklore is found everywhere from Western Europe to Japan and down throughout Africa, existing in what Blinkenberg calls, quote, remarkably similar forms, end quote, in all of those locations. He notes that in the Danish tradition, a stroke of lightning is quite literally thought to be the descent of a thunderstone, with the thunderclap and flash of light being mere secondary effects. So if Thor's name means thunder, and if these stones fall from the sky in association with thunder, we might expect to find traces of Thor throwing stones at his enemies in the surviving mythology, which we absolutely have here in the Gerother story. If we allow ourselves to believe that Thor's hammer is in any way connected to lightning, which some possible etymologies of the word Mjolnir might suggest, then the fact that he is so often throwing it at his enemies begins to make it sound like the hammer 
could even be an evolution of the ancient thunderstone motif as well. Archaeological evidence indicates that folklore surrounding thunderstones stretches deep into the pagan period, likely having been carried to Britain during the Anglo-Saxon migrations, according to McNamara. But if the idea of thunderstones is so old and so widespread, why is it that Thor has ended up with a hammer instead of, say, a bag of rocks as his primary weapon? The answer might lie in linguistics. As it turns out, there is a root in Proto-Indo-European, which is an ancestor language of Old Norse, among many other languages, that has been reconstructed as something like Akmon or Hekmon, and that word evolved into modern words for stone, hammer, and sky in various languages, especially with regard to concepts related to Indo-European thunder gods. Whereas Blinkenberg and Taggart prefer to disassociate Thor from Thunderstones themselves, Mallory sees them as the solution to this complex of words deriving from the same root that would otherwise seem completely unrelated. And actually, the linguistic relationship between hammer and stone in Germanic languages is surprisingly close. The Old Norse word hamar referred not only to a blacksmith's tool, but had additional meanings of crag, cliff, and rock or stone. So it's not too hard to imagine a time somewhere before the Norse period where the idea of a thunder god's hammer would have been expressed using words that literally meant both Thor's hammer and thunderstone. But the subtleties of this word don't end there. If we take two linguistic steps back in time from Old Norse to Proto-Germanic, it turns out that the Proto-Germanic root hamara could also be used to refer to the backside of an axe, which indicates an early association not only between stones and hammers, but with axes too. So why were stones, hammers, and axes so closely related in ancient times? Well, the Stone Age Indo-European ancestors of Germanic-speaking people arrived in southern Scandinavia and southwest Finland around 5,000 years ago. They belonged to an offshoot of the corded ware culture that we call battle axe or boat axe culture due to the unique and often boat-like shape of the stone battle axe heads they produced. You can imagine sort of a wedge-shaped front side like a dull axe and a hammer-shaped backside. These axe heads create a beautiful and satisfying intersection between axe, hammer, and stone in the pre-Norse linguistic timeline. And for this reason, lots of scholars have viewed them as an early incarnation of what we'll call the Germanic thunder weapon. But apart from linguistic evidence, we also have some archaeological evidence of axe jewelry being used in similar ways to Mjolnir jewelry, too. In 2019, Catherine Beard put together a database at atreedb.com where you can view information about the vast majority of archaeological Mjolnir pendant finds. Most Mjolnir pendants, if you've never seen one, have a very characteristic shape that honestly looks a little strange for a hammer, even in the medieval period. The hammerhead itself is usually symmetrical and sort of tapers on both ends, creating a silhouette that almost looks like a gentle crescent. If you take out some of the detail, what you end up with is the shape of an axe blade. And it turns out that there are actually a few Mjolnir-like pendants archaeologists have found that are clearly mimicking the shape of an axe blade instead of a hammer. As I mentioned, you can browse these for yourself if you'd like at atridb.com. That's E-I-T-R-I-D-B.com. So the question then becomes, did Mjolnir begin as an axe in the Stone Age and evolve over time into a hammer in the Norse period? Beard seems to think something like this may have happened, and it's hard not to look at the shapes of typical Mjolnir pendants and think they may have been influenced by the shape of an axe blade. But my own analysis of the data doesn't really provide much strong evidence for a shift from axes to hammers over time. The short version of the story is there are only five axe pendants in total. Two of them come from Sweden, and they are outnumbered by earlier and contemporary hammer pendants. One was even found on an amulet ring alongside two other obvious hammers. The other three axes come from Britain and are harder to date. If we accept later dates, they are likewise vastly outnumbered by contemporary hammers. If we accept earlier dates, they are rivaled by equally many club-shaped donar amulets. 
If we're looking for evolution, a better story probably comes from comparative mythology. In Finland, the god Ukko bears remarkable similarities to Thor and has been attested as wielding a hammer, a club, an axe, and a thunderbolt, both in the form of a wedge and as a bow with arrows. Salo believes that Ukko and Thor correspond so closely that they must be one and the same, and that Ukko is therefore an Indo-European transplant into Finnish mythology carried over by the boat axe culture. He notes that stone axes with a cult function continued to be manufactured well into the Bronze Age, and that one of these finds is actually decorated with what appear to be four lightning bolts. In Baltic lore, there is a red-bearded thunder god named Perkunas who wields an axe and rides in a chariot drawn by a goat, just like Thor's. Perkunas is also known to shoot fiery arrows that appear on Earth as small stone axes that have been termed thunderstones. The Slavic Perun is another thunder god with a goat-pulled chariot who traditionally carries many weapons. Specifically, Perun has been known to wield thunderbolts, sometimes called thunder arrows, a bow for shooting those arrows, a spear, a cudgel, and an axe that, like Mjolnir, returns to his hand after being thrown. In the Slavic tradition, belemnite fossils were traditionally thought to be remnants of Perun's thunderbolts, again, similar to thunderstones found elsewhere. It seems that whenever an equivalent or variant of Thor shows up outside of Scandinavia, he nearly always seems to come equipped with many weapons, including an axe and thunder projectiles. This is maybe where the axe pendants found in Britain and Sweden could possibly reinforce the idea that an old axe tradition persisted in some form among Germanic people for some amount of time. But one mystery remains. If the most ancient Germanic thunder god actually carried an array of weapons like his counterparts in nearby areas, why were all of them but the hammer forgotten? Unfortunately, we can only speculate. One idea is that it had something to do with the linguistic development of the word hamar in Old Norse. Perhaps as the word came to be used more and more exclusively to refer to a blacksmith's tool, Thor's weapon was cemented more and more as a hammer. Perhaps the northern pagan world felt the need to unify around a few core beliefs and symbols in the face of ever-encroaching Christianity. Perhaps a unification of the concept was even facilitated by the spread of the hammer pendants themselves. But no matter how we get from Proto-Indo-European Perkunos' club to the Norse Thor's hammer, and no matter how many weapons have been forgotten along the way, you definitely wouldn't want to be hit with anything Thor throws at you. That said, if you do happen to find a thunderstone laying around somewhere, bring it home for good luck. Or, for even better luck, make sure to catch the next episode of Norse Mythology, The Unofficial Guide. Sources for this episode include Agricola's Uko in Light of Archaeology, a chronological and interpretive study of ancient Finnish religion by Unto Salo, 1990. Dictionary of Northern Mythology by Rudolf Zemek, 2010. Encyclopedia of Russian and Slavic Myth and Legend by Mike Dixon Kennedy, 1998. Etymological Dictionary of Proto-Germanic by Goose Cronin, 2013. Gesta Donorum, translated by Karsten Fries Jensen and Peter Fischer, 2015. Hamarin Mjolnir, The Atri Database and the Evolution of the Hammer Symbol in Old Norse Mythology by Catherine Beard, 2019. Hercules Koila und Dona Amulet by Joachim Werner, 1964. How Thor Lost His Thunder by Declan Taggart, 2018. In Search of the Indo-Europeans by J.P. Mallory, 1991. Lithuanian Mythology by Gintaris Beresnevisius. Shepherd's Crowns, Fairy Loaves, and Thunderstones. The Mythology of Fossil Echinoids in England by Kenneth McNamara, 2007. The History of the Archbishops of Hamburg-Bremen, translated by Francis Chan, 2002. The Thunder Weapon in Religion and Folklore by Christian Blinkenberg, 1911. The Poetic Edda, translated by Caroline Larrington, 2014. And the Prose Edda, translated by Anthony Falks, 1995.